Islam has a rule that's more foundational than the Shahada, more important than prayer, more essential than giving alms. I call it Islam's 99-1 rule. Muslim leaders have relied on the 99-1 rule for 14 centuries. It's how they keep people from leaving Islam. It's how they keep people from questioning Islam. It's how they win new converts to Islam. Islam only exists because of the 99-1 rule, and yet no one talks about it. Until now. To understand Islam's 99-1 rule, think about Zakir Naik giving a presentation. Nike makes false claim after false claim after false claim, and yet the audience is sitting there, mindlessly nodding in agreement and cheering whenever he raises his voice. My friend Nabil once made a video titled, Zakir Nike, 25 Mistakes in 5 Minutes. I'll link to it at the end of this video. Nabil showed that in just 5 minutes of speaking, Zakir Naik made 25 factually false claims. That's an average of one factually false claim every 12 seconds. No one produces false statements at that rate except someone like Zakir Naik. And yet Naik is regarded by many as Islam's greatest living apologist. How does this happen? Let's think about a different scenario. Zakir Naik stands in front of his Muslim audience and tells his Muslim listeners that when Jesus talked about the Comforter or Helper in John 14, 16, he was really talking about Muhammad. Jesus said, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another Helper to be with you forever. So, someone was coming after Jesus. Who could this be? It must be the Prophet Muhammad. How many of the Muslims in that crowd are going to go back to their homes, open up their Bibles, or go to a Bible online, and actually read the chapter that Zakir Naik quoted so that they can make sure he was giving them reliable information? How many of them will look at the passage and realize that Jesus was talking to his original disciples, and that even in the verse Zakir Naik quotes, Jesus was telling his disciples that the Comforter or Helper would be with them forever. How was Muhammad with Jesus' original disciples forever? How many of Naik's listeners will read the very next verse and see that Jesus identified the Helper as the Spirit of Truth whom the world cannot see because he's a spirit, and that Jesus' disciples already knew the Helper because he was already with them and would soon be in them. In what sense was Muhammad an invisible spirit who was already with Jesus' disciples and would soon be in Jesus' disciples? How many of Nike's listeners will continue reading and see that Jesus, in the same chapter, identifies the Comforter or Helper as the Holy Spirit who is sent in Jesus' name and who would teach Jesus' original disciples all things and bring to their remembrance everything that Jesus said to them? How many of Nike's listeners will go on to read chapter 15 and chapter 16, where Jesus gives even more information about the Comforter? Even more information proving that this can't possibly be a prophecy about Muhammad. How many? Probably none. Probably zero. But we know that there are lots of Muslims who leave Islam, so we know that some Muslims do, on some occasions, critically examine the claims of their apologists. Let's be extremely generous and say that one out of a hundred will take the time to look up what Zakir Naik says in his lectures. Muslim speakers like Zakir Naik understand that only a tiny, tiny minority of their listeners will examine what they're saying. They know about this ratio. They count on it. They rely on it. They depend on it. Their focus is not on the one who fact-checks their claims. Their focus is on the 99 who don't. If 99% of your listeners mindlessly accept every word you say, and only 1% actually examine what you're saying and realize that you're making things up, the 99% can drown out, put down, insult, intimidate, abuse, and shout down the 1%. In other words, Islam's core method is designed for building a mob that silences dissenting voices. Now, if you're thinking critically, about what I've just claimed, as you should, 
you may be thinking to yourself, but can't Christians do the same thing? Can't atheists do the same thing? Isn't it a tiny minority of any crowd who are going to critically examine what a speaker is saying? So how is this unique to Islam? I'm glad you asked. There are four main differences between Islam and other ideologies that keep other ideologies from using the 99-1 rule in the way that Islam uses it. First, other systems have a higher degree of integrity built into them, either because they emphasize the pursuit of truth or because the adherents are encouraged to call out error. If I get something wrong in one of my videos, it's Christians who contact me and say, hey, you said this, but you're actually wrong. You need to fix that. By contrast, deception is part of the fabric of Islam. Allah brags about being the best of deceivers. Muhammad said that war is deceit. Muhammad gave his followers permission to deceive people when they carry out his orders. Not surprisingly, Islam ended up with speakers and apologists who gladly lie. Second, Islam is authoritarian in nature. Muslims are expected to unquestioningly obey Allah and Muhammad, and this was quickly extended to their religious leaders as well. In Surah 4, verse 65 of the Quran, Allah says to Muhammad, But know, by your Lord, they can have no faith until they make you, O Muhammad, judge in all disputes between them and find in themselves no resistance against your decisions and accept them with full submission. Notice, if you have the slightest resistance against anything Muhammad says, you have no real Islamic faith according to the Quran. So if you have a problem with Muhammad having sex with a nine-year-old girl, or with Muhammad marrying the ex-wife of his own adopted son after causing the divorce by lusting after her, or with Muhammad promoting wife-beating or prostitution or the rape of female captives and slave girls, you're not a real Muslim. Now, this is mindless obedience to Muhammad, but verses like this have had a disturbing impact on Muslims over the centuries. The Quran is very difficult to understand. It's a confusing, disorganized book that can only be understood by going to other sources. Looking for the historical context of specific verses and for how Muhammad and his followers interpreted these verses. This means that if you haven't carefully studied the Quran along with numerous other sources, you're probably going to get a lot of things wrong and you're probably going to end up disagreeing with Muhammad. And you really, really don't want to disagree with Muhammad. The result in the Muslim community has been that Muslims are encouraged to either learn all of it and become scholars or to keep their mouths shut and obey what their scholars say. The scholars are the ones who have studied Islam's most trusted sources and are therefore equipped to understand the meaning of the Quran. The average Muslim isn't, and so the average Muslim is strongly encouraged, to put it mildly, to mindlessly obey his religious leaders. This makes it very difficult for Muslims to even think of questioning someone like Zakir Naik, and this allows Zakir Naik to lie to them as much as he wants. Third, Islam has violence built into it. The penalty for leaving Islam is death. The penalty for blasphemy is death. The penalty for hypocrisy is death. Even in areas where Muslims aren't going to carry out the Sharia penalties for apostasy or blasphemy or hypocrisy, there's still a great deal of hostility and aggression directed towards anyone who questions or challenges the teachings of Muhammad. If you're the one Muslim out of a hundred who's willing to question Zakir Naik, and you're in a room with the 99 who mindlessly accept everything he says, they're going to view you as a bad person, a rebellious person, an undercover apostate who's trying to lead others out of Islam. Even if they don't kill you or beat you senseless, they're at least going to heap abuse on you, report you to your family and your imam, and tell everyone not to associate with you. This puts amazing pressure on Muslims to keep their doubts and their questions to themselves. Fourth, the 99-1 rule was part of Islam from the beginning. When Muhammad told his followers that there were prophecies about him in the Torah and the Gospel, how many of his followers were in a position to know 
whether the Torah and the Gospel contained prophecies about him. Very few of his followers were even literate, and even fewer would have had access to a copy of the Torah or the Gospel. Even fewer would have bothered to sit down and read the entire Torah and the entire Gospel to see whether they contained prophecies about Muhammad. Now, let's once again be generous and suppose that one out of a hundred of Muhammad's followers went to the Torah, went to the Gospel, and realized that both of these books thoroughly contradict Muhammad and his teachings. This troublemaker stands up and says, Muhammad, I just read the Torah and the Gospel, and these books completely contradict what you're telling us. I can only conclude that you're a false prophet. How are the other 99 going to respond? They don't know what's in the Torah. They don't know what's in the Gospel. All they can do is believe what someone else claims about the Torah and the Gospel. Who are they going to believe? Muhammad, the prophet of Islam who will have you executed for disagreeing with him, or some random guy who claims that Muhammad is lying? Easy decision, and the 99 quickly silence the one by executing him for apostasy. Throughout the 14 centuries of Islam's existence, Muslim leaders have understood that as long as you can build the biggest mob, and as long as this mob is willing to become violent, you can silence anyone who gets in your way. If, out of every hundred listeners, 99 mindlessly accept what is said, and only one questions what is said, the 99 can silence the one through pressure, ridicule, intimidation, abuse, or violence. That's been Islam's bread and butter since the year AD 610. So, how do those of us who are now aware of Islam's reliance on the 99-1 rule counteract its use by people like Zakir Naik? Well, we have to recognize the times we're in. Many of us live in countries that protect our right to speak, and to question, and to challenge, and to refute. Islamic leaders are in no position to silence us. Even in countries where Islamic leaders can silence people, people still have internet connections. We can speak and question and challenge and refute in Pakistan, in Iran, in Saudi Arabia, through the power of technology. That gives us a power to counteract Islam's 99-1 rule that no generation before us could have dreamed of. The one may be outnumbered by the 99, but the one can be smarter, wiser, louder, and braver than the 99. And the one now has help all around the world, a fearless, relentless, international squad of free people who know the truth about Muhammad and the Quran. We will not stop until every lie is exposed, every liar is shamed, and 100 out of 100 have heard a clear presentation of the truth. Be the one, or help the one. Back down from none until we've won. I love my work. In the comments, I'd like you to share any other examples you can come up with of Muslim speakers using Islam's 99-1 rule. Don't forget to subscribe and to terrorize that like button and to share this video with anyone who might need it, which is everyone.